Thank you, Caroline, for a, a, a fascinating talk, a wonderful glimpse into what is obviously a very complex world of technology. Okay. Um, we have a few minutes for, for questions, but perhaps I can take the liberty of asking the first question, mm -hmm. if I may. So um, the mathematician Harding, of course, was very famous because mm -hmm. he, he loved number theory and he particularly mm -hmm. liked the fact that number theory was completely devoid of any practical yes. application. Yes. He was very proud of that. Um, and, of course, he turned out to be rather mistaken because in the mm -hmm. 21st century, number mm -hmm. theory, of course, is, mm -hmm. is critical to cryptography mm -hmm. and internet commerce and it's of yep, yep. huge practical importance. I'm wondering where, as of today at least, where does topology sit on the sort of spectrum of applicability? Are you going to ask me where does topology sit? Right. Um, um, well, I thought you were going to ask me where hyperbolic geometry sits, but where does topology... Ask, ask that question as well, if you wish. Okay, topology can tell you things. For example, we have somebody in the audience here. Um, DNA, a long string of strands of DNA, twist themselves up in all sorts of complicated knots. And biologists, by some means, manage to cut them and then they rejoin them. Well, nature does that. And topology and the study of knots has a great deal to say that can help you understand the kind of possibilities of the way this twisting can happen. That's one small answer. Um, <laughs> um, I have a question. What would a galaxy or solar system look like in a universe with hyperbolic geometry? Uh, ah, that's a good question. I'm not sure you could say it itself would look... Yeah, I, I can't answer that, but let me say something related, which, which I might have answered you. So... Uh, have you come across the cosmic background radiation? So if we imagine looking back or out in the universe to what happened really at the very beginning of the universe, and there is this radiation that's out there that is kind of the remnants of what happened just after the Big Bang. Now, in recent years, there have been these space probes going out trying to measure the radiation, and what they're partly trying to do is to see whether the universe is flat or curved. Now, if you imagine that we were living in a universe that was really the shape of one of these hyperbolic things, but on a vast, vast scale, then when we looked out very far, we might see a picture that actually, well, it wouldn't look like this because the scale is so vast, but it might be that if you looked out in that direction, then actually what you would see would be the same as if you looked out over in that direction and over in that direction. So there was an idea um, promulgated by someone called Jeff Weeks, who's a student of Thurston's, that you could study the sort of simplest kinds of non-trivial geometries uh, or topologies that might model the universe. And if they had sufficiently fine measurements of this background radiation, you might see these patterns repeated. And from seeing where you saw the same thing, in which directions, you would be able to work out what the geometry was and therefore what shape the universe was. Unfortunately, the most recent data seems to indicate that it's kind of inconclusive. It's pretty nearly flat, so probably it's not one of these rather wonderful shapes, but it might be. I mean, it's not being quite ruled out. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, sorry. You said there were just sort of three geometries in 2D, but you said there were then eight geometries in 3D, yeah. including um, yeah. sort of yeah. a plane sort of level, um, hyperbolic yeah. and spherical. Um, what are some of the other five well, like? Right, well, the other five, it's quite interesting because um, at the sort of end of the 19th century, there was quite a lot of debate about what geometry was. And actually, those three are the only kinds where everything looks exactly the same in all directions, whichever way you turn. So the other ones have all got some something... So from point to point, it looks the same, but maybe there's a kind of preferred direction or a preferred plane. So it's not quite that whichever way you face, it looks the same, but it's still... So Thurston managed to pick out 
um, some characteristics that you would expect something you might call geometry to have. So um, the simplest other ones to understand are you might have um, you might have a sphere crossed with a line, or you might have hyperbolic space in a plane and then Euclidean space this way, for example. Okay, so those sort of things like that. Those slightly hybrid kind of things. Um, but they have a property that wherever you, there's a kind of homogeneity, but you can't, not everything is quite the same in every direction. And actually, the other ones, they're all actually quite simple, and they describe things which topologically are relatively simple. So they sort of be listed and dealt with somehow. This, the hyperbolic is the really interesting one. I think we have a question from this side. I'm, sorry, yes. I, I was really interested by the fact that the proofs seemingly got easier in more dimensions. Yeah. Um, do the proofs at any stage become trivially simple? And what happens to a proof in an infinite number of dimensions? Uh, they don't become trivially simple. <laughs> <laughs> If you're in finite dimensions, you go out in a fi you know you can go out in three ways. So even in a ball of you know radius one, you've only sort of got three different things you can do. But if you're in an infinite dimensional space, you can go out in an infinite number of ways. So in a ball of radius one, you've got infinite number of things you can do, and then you have to be much more careful about how you start measuring distance and everything, and all sorts of new possibilities come in. So the whole issue becomes vastly more complicated. I was intrigued by the heptagonal um, image you had earlier on in hyperbolic space, and I was thinking, well, in flat space you have... You mean the hept yeah. heptagonal one? The hepta yeah, heptagonal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. because obviously in flat yeah. space you've yeah. got equilateral triangle squares yeah, and yeah. hexagons. I was just wondering, are there other examples, what, class, um, what different regular polygons actually right. tile? Because I can picture yeah. spherical geometry, you've got three... Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. So in, in spherical geometry there's a certain number of regular solids that tile the sphere, and we know them, sort of icosahedron and dodecahedron and so on. In Euclidean space, you can list all the kind of tilings. Um, and, it, and the tilings rest on the fact that you can't do more because the angle sum in a triangle is 180. Mm -hmm. And if you try and work out what your task could be like, you find there aren't many options. In hyperbolic space, because the angle sum can be anything less than 180, there's actually infinitely many possibilities. So there's a vast, vast array of tilings, and that's why you can get all this vastly more complicated. So, so I mean, you can try and classify tilings by triangles or in different ways. There's lots and lots of different types. But, uh, and these tessellations have extremely interesting structure, the way all the tiles fit together, the kind of combinatorics of how they fit is very important and beautiful, actually. So it's a whole different world out there, much, much more complicated and intricate than Euclidean. So I can't give you a finite right, list. Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Question here? Going back to proofs, um, which got you most, most excited when you heard that, that it was proved? Fermat's last theorem or Poincaré conjecture? And can you talk about sort of the scale of the problem and what you think of the, of the elegance of the proofs? Um, dear. <laughs> I mean, actually, somehow mathematics in the last, I don't know, 20 years, I mean, all the wonderful things are being proved one after the other. It's as if we spent, you know, 200 years kind of figuring out the right techniques to do things. And people know so much and then you know brilliant people managed to put it together but they're all building on the, on all these techniques and tools that have happened before i mean fermat's last theorem is kind of i suppose in a way i know more about that uh, that is pretty w remarkable i mean just the number to go from this problem in number theory all the way through what has to be gone through to come to the proof is is I don't know that I cared very much about Fermat's last theorem, but it is completely astonishing what has to be gone through and what came out of finding a proof of it. 
Thank you. Uh, you've referred repeatedly to the use of computers to, yes. uh, to help solve yeah, the problems. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand, um, do you actually end up with solutions uh, where the computers have helped you understand, but you actually end up with, with, with a purely um, mathematical, uh, um, elegant okay. proof? Yeah. Or are you utterly dependent on the computer solution ah. uh, as being the only means to prove it? Which then brings a uh, corollary yeah, actually, of will you, will you be able to right. do more as computing power increases? Right. Um, it is actually a mixture. So I just read actually a rather nice quote from Thurston. Thurston did a lot of computing. I think typically what happens is people compute, maybe they do lots of examples, they make pictures, that inspires them to think something must be true, and then they spend several years, or maybe more, sweating away, and in the end they have a theorem. So I think often it goes that way. But their proof does not involve the computing. Okay, but there are other cases where, as I said, something like the four color problem is an example. So something is proved up to checking some large number of cases. And large nowadays can be pretty large, and people write incredibly clever programs for checking very, very complicated things. So if I can say, this is true provided you can rule out all these you know, million examples of possible configurations, someone can then make a program that can check all that. And you, you can argue about whether or not that's mathematics, but it's been done quite a lot now. There's also stuff that people do in, in this subject. So um, when you compute, if it's a numerical thing you're computing, you might say, well, how do you know this number that, you know, if this number is crucial, how do you know it's right? Maybe the computer made errors, right? So you can also compute um, with exact error bounds in very precise ways so that you make absolutely certain that whatever you... So there are some things like this stuff about finding the hyperbolic manu manifold whose volume is least possible. So you compute, but you have to compute with getting your error bounds absolutely right. And you have to check bunches of stuff, rule out bunches of stuff. But every time you do it, you have to sort of prove that you're, you couldn't possibly be wrong. Of course, you might be, but... <laughs> yeah. And we'll take our last question at the back then. So how do things like sine waves and cosine waves behave in hyperbolic space compared to Euclidean space? I think you would say that sine waves and cosine waves are still the same. But is, is it really a sine and a cosine wave is something that goes with periodic translations along a line. So if you want to think about things that are vibrations, say the vibrations of a drum, so a circle in 2D, you need to think about Bessel functions. So if you want to think about things that vibrate right going with hyperbolic things, you get into something called automorphic functions. So there are kind of functions that behave going along with the... Yeah, a sine function is a sine function, but it belongs to the periodicity of translations along a line. And there are other functions that work in these other cases. Thank you. Um, I know there are other questions, but sadly we are out of time. I think we need to bring the, the formal part of the evening to, to a conclusion. Um, Carolyn, it's been a fascinating lecture. You have succeeded at least in giving me the illusion that I understand a little piece of this area of mathematics. <laughs> well done. Thank you, you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you.